Babiš. Uh, how many of you have deployed a web application or a web server before? Yeah, presumably, right? This is a cloud, uh, talk about the cloud, so presumably most of you have done that. Uh, and so presumably, you know, you know, when you're deploying, you're redeploying a, a web application, a live one, there's this feeling that usually you feel in the pit of your stomach that's a lot like the feeling that you get when you're giving a talk. <laughs> like this anxiety. What's going to happen? Is everything going to work? Am I going to take down the entire website, the entire infrastructure? Um, and, and to some extent, having this anxiety is quite justified. I mean, even big and professional places like Facebook or like Twitter used to be, um, they, they do this, right? Um, they, Facebook, about a year ago, um, deployed a change to their DNS and took down not only all of their websites, but even the sort of uh, system that allowed people to swipe into the office. Um, quite a big disaster. So, I mean, when you're faced, and, and Twitter, just two weeks ago, um, locked themselves, locked their front end out of their own back end API. Um, so, when you see things like this, um, obviously, and you think, oh, if I press this button, what's going to happen? Obviously, there's a lot of anxiety there. And in the less professional settings, um, but by less professional, I mean either a hobbyist project or else a company that has fewer than a thousand software developers. Um, this, this happens potentially more often. Uh, uh, very often people just accept, because it's just too annoying to do anything about it, that there'll be a little bit of downtime, for instance. Uh, or that something might go wrong and you'll have to roll back. Um, and obviously, there's nothing, there's no single solution to all these problems, right? Like a lot of this is, is about the application code, um, making sure that you test the application code, that you have best practices. Um, but a lot of it is also about things that are specific to cloud deployments. Um, and, and by being specific to cloud deployments, I in general uh, apply to all of these uh, systems. So I want to talk about that. Um, today. Um, uh, the way this talk is structured uh, is that I'm first going to, in the first part I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the wish list, you might say, of, of a proper um, deployment system, a deployment strategy that avoids as many of these problems as possible. And the way in which I'm going to develop that wish list is by sort of going through like a a couple of deployment scenarios and see what goes wrong, and then we say, okay, well, that's definitely not something we want, and then we add that to the wish list. And then I'll, I'll switch back and I'll talk a little bit about Nix, uh, or at least the part of Nix that is relevant for my talk, um, so that everyone has a sort of common background in both um, deployment, infrastructure, DevOps generally, and Nix. And then I'll see how that uh, enables. And uh, then I'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this enables uh, a new deployment strategy that um, I think is very promising. The context for this is that um, I founded Gynex recently, um, which is a Nix CI and hosting company. Um, and you know, I really want to make it easy to deploy relatively complicated infrastructures. You just push the GitHub and it deploys your infrastructure. Um, and in order to do that, you sort of really want to get right uh, in a sort of automated, simplified way um, all of this logic. But I think that the sort of basic idea is something that you can take away even if you don't choose not to use Kernix. Um, yeah, so the wish list. Again, we can't really decide whether a system is good or bad unless we know what good or bad is, right? Like what can go wrong and what can go right. Um, so let's look at some deployment types and see what goes wrong and right. So this is a uh, color is a little bit different from here in the computer, but I think it's okay. Um, <laughs> here is a bunch of boxes and a bunch of arrows. Um, in this case, what the boxes refer to are web services. I, I won't, it won't matter for the most part what exactly that means, whether that's a container, whether that's a VM, whether 
and that's an instance group, whether there's a replica set, set in Kubernetes, whether it's an executable that you SSH into Tmux and start and leave running. Um, it's just conceptually like a service, right? Um, but there are a few of them and they communicate with one another. The, hopefully you can see the dotted line over there in the right. That's the line between the external world and, and our private network. Now, so those are requests coming from the external world. And all the arrows otherwise are requests within our network. Right? So we have multiple services. You can imagine, I don't know, this could be like a pets database, right? Where you have people, a people service, and a pet service, and there's maybe an address service, and the entire thing tells you, I don't know, tells you who owns what pets, or something like that. Um, doesn't matter. So let's say that we have a new version of this service over here in the bottom left. What can we do? Well, the simplest thing, the thing that usually people start out with, um, is, you know, again, is, is to just shut down the running version, right? Um, you shut it down. If it was a TMAC, if it was an executable that was just running in the TMAC shell, you just do control C over there. Um, and then you start it again, right? Um, if this was a system D service, you just you know, deploy a new version and restart that service. But in, for a brief second, we turn it off, and there are requests that are going to be um, go nowhere because there's nothing running. Right? You turned it. You turned that service off. Eventually, you turn on the new version, and everything goes back to normal. Right? Um, so yeah. So here you see. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this, does this, what this represents make sense? Cool. Ask questions, by the way. Um, so, so in this simple scenario, you know, it's really great because of simplicity, there are these two problems. One of them is the downtime of that service, right? We took that service down and then we started a new one. Um, that's not good. Another one that we have to worry about a little bit is, um, is that the previous version of the, ser of the service uh, might still be processing requests. If we just shut it down to immediately, uh, those requests might not be processed till the end, right? It might be doing some work and it might forget about it. It might not be able to sort of respond to this service, for instance, in time. And this is kind of an intrinsic problem of this deployment system because, well, you know, if we if we leave it shutting down for too long, then actually the number of requests, then it's non-operational for a while longer, so then we lose even more requests. Or we queue them up, and then the complexity is increasing. Um, you know, you can't have like a, a queue that you hold, uh, but then the latency is also increasing. Uh, but at a basic level, we, want, we don't want those two bigger problems, right? We don't want downtime, and we want to be able to process every request. I imagine that uh, some of you have an idea about how you might do that. Yeah? Start a copy of the service. Yeah, exactly. Start a copy of the service. Um, and in the meantime, don't do anything, right? Um, and now when this is ready, right? When this is, when uh, there's probably a readiness check, I don't know, there's some way of checking that, you know, that, that the system has really been Start it up and is ready to receive requests. And when it is, you flip all the traffic to this new version. And then another advantage is that you can wait for, for, for the first server to finish processing whatever request it has, right? You can just leave it running. Um, now, this solves those two problems, but it introduces other ones. One, which is maybe not that big a deal, is that actually doing this logic is a little bit more complicated. How, how did you flip this from one side to the other? The answer is usually something like a, a, a proxy or a service mesh or service discovery. You're going to have to add logic. I'm not going to get into much into what these things are, but you're going to have to add a little bit of logic here um, to make this work. Uh, now the other problem is, you know, it was really nice that we got to start the service and wait for the readiness check if we have one, 
Um, but then also uh, do health checks or, or, or quality uh, QA manually, right? I don't know, like um, you start a server, you maybe visit a couple of websites or do a couple of recurl requests manually to make sure that everything is working, and you have that luxury because that system is is um, not yet connected to, to, to before you switch all the traffic over to it, you have some time to do whatever you need in order to assure yourself that things are working. And that's really nice, but it only applies to this server. If it so happens that with the new version, so, you know, if with this new version I, uh, I really screwed everything up and it doesn't even respond to any HTTP requests, I'll probably notice. Uh, my, my health checks or whatever it is, they'll tell me. Um, but if it's a little bit more subtle, and this service over here now can no longer work with this service over here because something about the API changed, um, I don't know, an endpoint got renamed, I'm not going to notice. Because these two services only start interacting once I, I, I add, once, once I properly add it to uh, the deployment infrastructure, when it's too late, it's already live. Um, so that's one problem. Um, I don't get to test the entire infrastructure, right? And the interaction between these systems. Um, and there's another problem which is sometimes, you know, kind of related, but sometimes I really want to deploy deploy a backwards incompatible change. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of annoying to like always have to, even internally, I understand externally, but even internally to always have to have back, uh, backwards compatible changes. It just makes any system become a legacy system very quickly. But in order to be able to make a backwards incompatible change, uh, I need to deploy two, I need to change this system and then also this system, for instance, right? The API is changing, so these two systems need to change at the same time. And usually, this deployment infrastructure doesn't let me do that as a sort of coordinated deploy. Um, does it make sense so far? So this, are there ideas about what we might do to solve this problem? Use a monolith. Use a? Monolith. A monolith. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Any other ideas? Yeah. You could replicate the whole system. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so this we, we talked about, um, so yeah, so the next idea, the next deployment system is to just replicate the entire infrastructure. Um, uh, and then when everything is up and running, you can test, before, the, before it's live, you can test everything, make sure that everything works, uh, and then when you're convinced that it, that, that it works, you can change the traffic, and then wait for the entire system to, to, to shut down. and. Um, but um, there are again a couple of problems with this, and this is, in fact, I think most people don't use this system. Uh, so, concretely, the way you might do this is just, for instance, a blue green deploy. Right? So, you have the entire uh, infrastructure duplicated, you have like machines over here, you have machines over there. Whenever, whenever there's a new version, you deploy. You have the blue system, you have the green system. When the blue system is live, uh, when you have a new version, you deploy to the non-live system, and then you switch the traffic, and then next time you deploy over there. There are many ways of instantiating this type of, uh, this, this type of system. Um, Blue-green is probably the most familiar. Um, but one of the problems that people have with this is that it's quite slow, it's resource intensive. Um, it's slow because, um, Previously, you're only deploying one system, right? Um, maybe there's a bit of a startup time. Um, the startup time of the entire system is usually more than just the maximum of the startup times of the individual components because they have to wait for one another a little bit before they're, they're live. Um, and so, so this takes a while. Um, it's kind of annoying as well because if you, want, if you, you, know, if you believe in CD and deploying continuously, <laughs> You can get like a queue, an unbounded queue of new, new, new deploys, right? Like if, if the people responsible for this, this service over here deploy a new version um, and the system is starting up, 
Um, uh, still setting up, and then someone else deploys a new version of this system, then either you have uh, three copies of the infrastructure now, all queued to go live, or else you know you have to wait in some other sense. It, it gets kind of nasty. Um, also, it's kind of hard to know when you can turn off the old machines. Like, essentially, let's let the old requests be processed. But now that we have this entire infrastructure, it's kind of hard to know when, when it's safe to do this. Because you can ask one machine, hey, do you have, a, do you have any requests that you're ready to shut down? Um, and it might say, um, yeah, I'm ready. Um, and then this machine, and then you ask this machine, uh, are you ready to shut down? Because you can't do anything simultaneously in the real world. Uh, you ask this machine to, uh, whether it's ready to shut down, and it says, yeah, I I'm ready. But in between, this machine sent a request to this machine, and so now this machine is no longer ready to shut down because it received some work that was already within your network. Um, and so then you're still going to get like a, a, a request that wasn't fully processed. Um, so that's, that's no good. That was already a requirement. Um, so yeah, so how, how do you know when to shut down the system is the problem here. Um, um, we want, so we want fast efficient deploys, deploying the, the entire network every time is, is not that. Um, so what is, what, what's an option here? So one step in, in uh, coming up with the best solution, does anyone have an idea of what this might be? Because maybe your idea is different than mine, and then <laughs> I'll quickly change the rest of the talk. <laughs> okay, there's one more thing, hot code reloading. Yeah. But I don't know if it actually solves the entirety of the problem that you just uh, sketched out. Yeah, hot code reloading, I think that that, uh, that probably does solve a lot of the problems, but it's very sort of stack specific, right? Um, it's hard to sort of get that to work with any system, right? Um, yeah? Uh, redeploy the system only after the point where the API is changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, what, I, I don't know your name, but what that person said is redeploy the system only up to the place where the API is changed. Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I, if I understood correctly, but I'll, I'll say what I'm thinking, and then, and then we can continue from there. But it, it, what, the problem that we had was that if we redeploy the system, this might break, and that might break. But that's not going to break. Because this is a dependence relationship. These requests are a dependence relationship. Think about your, your, you know, your web application and your database. Um, you know, if, uh, if your, data, your database doesn't need your web application, uh, it receives requests from your web app, but it doesn't need it. It can live separately, um, it's perfectly healthy if your web app has gone down. The opposite is not true, right? That dependence relationship is there. It's actually, if you think long and hard about what the dependence relationship actually is and means, it's, it's more complicated than it seems. Um, but Roughly, this is the idea, right? That this is a dependence relationship. And so, given that there's no dependence error from this system to that system, if this system changes, that one is going to be fine. I don't need to test it again. So I only need to redeploy these three items if this one changes. If this changes, I only need to deploy these two items, and if that one changes, only that one. So that, this is already an improvement. Um, and in fact, I, 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 again, I don't know if this is where you were going, in fact, you can sometimes say, okay, actually, I don't even need to redeploy the other, these other two systems, because I know that insofar as it matters, this hasn't matters to this system, this hasn't changed. I might get into this if I have time, but it probably won't. Uh, but the first improvement is just to deploy that subset. So, okay, so we're done with the talk, right? It's just like, deploy those three items if that one change, and that's it, right? Now, the big problem here is that we are looking at this nice, picture of the topology of our infrastructure, but we never really have that. Like, these are web apps that have, you know, tens, tens of thousands of lines of code, and they might be making a request anywhere, a request anywhere in that code to any other system. Um, 
So we don't have this picture. We, we might have an informal one. We might sort of draw it in the whiteboard. Um, we're not even 100% sure that, that as developers, we're not 100% sure that that is accurate. We might be wrong. Um, but also our tools, our automated tools, um, you know, it's kind of annoying if like a developer has to input this, even if they happen to be um, correct. So how can we get this picture? How can we do this if we don't have this picture? So okay. So this is uh, the end of the first part. I just wanted to make a couple of points. I'm not going to be talking about um, cycles or um, dynamic graphs. Dynamic graphs might happen, for instance, with uh, webhooks. You make a request to uh, a service and you give it a URL and substance it's what request it makes afterwards depends on that value, right? Um, I'm not going to talk about those two things. They don't really change any of the of, of the picture in any important way, but it just would make the talk longer. Uh, I'm not going to talk about persistence because um, it would make the talk a lot longer. It's like a two or three other talks. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we have a, a, an idea of, 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 of the problem place, uh, a s slight improvement or a, a big improvement sometimes in the uh, potential solution. How do we implement it? Um, so we're going to take uh, inspiration from NICS, um, a, pro uh, a project that's primarily addressing a seemingly quite different problem space. Um, and here's a quick introduction to, to, to Nix. Again, this is a very biased introduction. It won't actually help you that much with Nix, but it will help you so far as this talk is concerned. So this is a, a simple script. Um, and um, what does it do? It doesn't really matter, but you know, it finds every markdown file in the current directory and replaces foo with bar in it, and then writes that file back. Um, it has here we have several um, executables that when whoever wrote the script um, was expecting to exist um, in the system that runs it, right? So the bash bin bash bash, that's presumably something I can interpret this script, right? So I, the dependency is that I expect um, slash bin slash bash, slash bash to be a file and that file to be a version of bash that makes sense with this. I also expect find, and I missed sh, but find, sh, set, sponge, all of those things, I expect those things to be in the path variable, right? Um, so I expect there to be a, a path variable that has a bunch of directories, and within one of those directories, I expect to find, find, and sponge, and whatnot. And I expect those things to be executables that make sense, right, for, for my purposes. They're, I expect them to actually be the find and presumably actually probably the right version of the find executable because with, <laughs> with this world, there's always incompatibilities, right? Like if you're on a Mac, probably one of those flags is different, I don't know. Um, so that's kind of annoying, right? But let's, 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 let's redraw this a little bit in a more suggestive way, right? So I mean, this the script is asking the path variable, hey, give me find. And then from, in response to that, it's asking the file system, hey, give me the executable uh, find and set and sponge and whatever it is. This is kind of just to be a bit more suggestive. This is not that good a picture of what's actually happening, but, but just to sort of pump our intuitions about the similarities. Um, yeah. Um, so, this is problematic, right? The fact that there the, are all these implicit dependencies is problematic. Um, it might be that someone doesn't have Sponge installed. So when they try to run the script, it doesn't work. It might be that they have the wrong version of Sponge installed. So it all works in a completely different way. Potentially, it's even worse. Um, uh, to fix this, the first thing we're going to do is get rid of the path variable, just reference all of the um, executables directly by path. So we can do that. Right? Let's just assume that they're all in slash bin. So now, now it can't happen that someone changes the path variable and then screws everything up because we're not using it anymore. But it can still happen that someone changes what slash bin slash find is. 
and then screws this up again, right? And this happens very naturally because maybe there's a system upgrade or some other script uh, needs a different version, so you go and uh, up upgrade that and you break this script. So uh, what we do is we um, then rename all the files so that they contain the hash of the source code. So the version of bash is going to be going to have a hash. We remove all of the ones. We remove all the items in bit slash bin that don't have a hash, um, and we only allow the ones that have a hash there. Um, and the hash is going to be the hash of the source code um, that built this, right? So we do the same thing with the script itself. Uh, it's now it now has a hash, which is this the hash of this, right? Um, so now if there's a version of, bit of find and another version of find, they can coexist, it doesn't matter. We don't let anyone sort of change this unless, unless it happens to be for something with exactly the same hash code as the uh, same source. Um, so we get rid of all these problems, right? In practice, in order to, in, rather than asking you to write that horrible thing, we, what you do is you you use these special interpolation variables or whatever, at a sort of build step, it uh, Nix will replace um, these with the, the hashes that you wanted, right? It could be, uh, this is a very simple build step, and Nix, the build steps can get, be, be much more complicated, but this is the crucial part for us, right? Does this make sense? Yeah, okay. So, um, so importantly, uh, I made a mistake here, but it's a useful mistake. SH is, is, doesn't have the hash thing. So what I said was that there's no more, there are no more files, there's no more paths, and there are no more files without a hash. So this is going to fail because that doesn't exist. And that's important. Why is it important? Because we know that for any script, all of the executables that it uses, we know it statically. In this build step, we, we know, uh, we, we did all the replacements. It's, no one's going to put the, this, this random thing in the source code. That's kind of the assumption. Um, <laughs> no one's going to be crazy enough to do that. They're all going to use the, the, those variables over there. So as a build step, we know exactly what the dependencies are. Does that make sense? You can't reference find any other way than with the hash, because there is no other find than the hash one. And the only practice, the hashes, by the way, are much longer. Um, the only way of, of, of you're going to do that is by using this system here. Um, okay, so this is again a, a more suggestive way of looking at this. We have the script; it's referencing a bunch of things. If we want to change the version of Sponge that it uses, you know, we we create we have that version of Sponge. We now have a few, new version of the script that references the old versions of of everything else. The hash is different because the source code of the script is different. Um, and then, you know, th this external world here might be your shell. You know, you, in your shell, you do something like that script that is rather than script, you know, use bash or find or whatever it is. Uh, but these, these, the, the, there they sort of result to something different potentially. And so when we're done building this and happy with it, we, we switch the shell to reference this instead. Um, and we might, as an extra step, realize that nothing is pointing to that, so we can garbage collect that, and we might realize that nothing's pointing to this version of Sponge, so we can garbage collect that as well. Um, and that's how an upgrade happened. Okay, so presumably, at least vaguely, the similarity between these problems is becoming a, a bit clearer. Um, so this is... Um, this is roughly what I, the syntax that I'm thinking of, but the idea is that your services, they're not gonna, they're not gonna use URLs in the traditional way, in the traditional sense, to talk to one another. Um, they're gonna use URLs with hashes, and the hashes are the hash of the source code of the service that they wanna talk to. Um, and so you can have the variable interpolation or whatever in a similar way. Um, if you're familiar with Nexus, so the syntax will make a bit more sense, but otherwise, the only important part is that anywhere in your source code, if you want to talk to one of these services, you have to use this variable local interpolation because you're not going to be able to guess their hashes otherwise. Um, 
And so at the build step, we know um, we know that uh, we know the dependency graph. Um, yeah. So each for each each version is going to get a, a name, right? So you kind of have the pets over there, just so it's a little bit easier in the log to figure out which, which abstractly which service it is. Uh, but there's only that name. Um, and there's a, a nice idea here about, I mean, basically this, the same text came up in, in garbage, uh, garbage collection, in reference to garbage collection a couple of talks ago, right? This is now just a relatively simple garbage collection uh, task to know when to shut down the system because you have the entire um, topology, the graph of the system. Um, because not having the topology of the system not only didn't allow you to do the basic thing that we wanted, which is just deploy the basic, uh, the, the minimum subset, but it didn't even let you figure out how to shut down gracefully while handling all of these things. Because you don't know, you know, if this system uh, is still alive, does this mean that I can send a request to this system? So do you have to keep this alive? It's, you don't know. So, so, so the shutdown system is also much nicer. So yeah, so what happens is exactly what we talked about before. We deploy these three systems, right? And so, um, there are a couple of, uh, yeah, so this is true of the script before and of the Nix world, and it's true here as well. Each service is only going to talk to um, one service. So you can look at the hash of, the, so if you're talking to uh, a, B, D, one, slash best dot com. Implicitly, you also know what version of the downstream service this, this system is talking to. So that's quite nice for the logs as well. And if something goes wrong, you, you know you can sort of reconstruct its entire world just from that uh, bit of information. Um, so yeah, so how do we do? Uh, so yeah, so there is no downtime, we pass the request. The fast, efficient deploys, uh, so backwards and compatible changes are, are the, the pre-deployment and the time checks and all of those are going to be, as we talk, talked about before, those we did okay on. Um, the fast, efficient deploys, um, is that, it sort of depends, right? Because it, this is kind of, I mean, presumably you notice that this is very much like a, uh, system data structures, right? When you change something in a in a list, for instance, what do you have to like? What stays and what's new? Um, that's intuitively how much you have to redeploy. Um, and so, depending on what your graph, what what your topology actually looks like, you might have to re redeploy almost as much as if it were the entire system, um, or much less, right? Um, it will vary based on which service you're redeploying and what your topology looks like. Um, so whether this is much better or, or just a little bit better um, will, will vary from case to case. Um, but, um, again, one thing I didn't mention is it can, let's say that you redeploy the system and the way, sorry, the way in which you do checks um, is you know you have a QA so you redeploy the system and you're gonna do some some checks, right? It could be some automated checks or it could be manual checks. And what do you do? You would maybe you visit the website and click on a couple of things. And what does that mean? Well this it means that this makes a request to this and make this makes a request to this. Uh, you can um, in that case for instance um, do something like record uh, what what the conversation between these two systems were. And then when you redeploy the system, you just replay this conversation over here and say, actually, all the replies were exactly the same. So I know that insofar as that this test is concerned, I don't actually need to redeploy this. So getting into more detail about how this works, this, this is more complicated. It has a lot of corner cases. And, but getting, so getting into details about how you might actually safely say, no, I want to just redeploy this, and I don't have to redeploy the upstream ones. And I can still get the guarantees that I wanted, uh, that the entire system is going to function well. That's still possible, um, but that's that's more work. Here we just sort of sort of maybe approximately halved um, in this case um, the number of, of of systems deployed. 
Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that's it. This is uh, this is this is roughly the idea. Um, thanks a lot. Are there any questions? I would be interested how this looks in practice. Where are the places you can implement these hashes? Is it just URLs or what what way where does he apply? Yeah, yeah. So 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 again, so one thing that I forgot to mention just before I answer is uh, one big advantage of the system as well is just the sort of infrastructural simplicity. Um, you like, it, it, like if you look at something like Kubernetes or whatever, right, there's so many other bits of software that are running in your infrastructure besides the one that you're deploying consciously to get everything working, precisely because of this sort of networking changes and I don't know, rolling from one system to another. Um, and this, because you get a lot more information statically, you can actually get rid of the, those runtime bits of software. Um, but to okay, so what's happening with the URL? Uh, the URL, the idea is um, that it's just a DNS thing, right? It's just tell the DNS, hey, there's a new service, um, and this is the URL. Um, but of course, you could choose to to do this in other ways as well, with a proxy in between or, or a service mesh of a different type. But you can change the URL only in the DNS, not in the service it's connecting to the URL. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so you only change, so you never change anything, right? Um, <laughs> but you inform the, the DNS of a new, new URL, right? So that's also kind of nice because you get to use DNS a little bit more safely and a little bit less annoyingly, right? So you can actually use, so uh, Kubernetes deploys its own DNS service into your system. Um, whereas here, I, I believe, <laughs> I haven't tested this, by, by the way, this is in a half-half state, it's like, part, I would say that about maybe 30% of it's implemented and I'm testing it, um, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, but if you if people want to play with it, uh, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but um, with DNS, there's, just, uh, there's this problem where there's a lot of caching, right? So if you want to change, if you want to update things, uh, it takes a long time, uh, which means that you know people tend to not use DNS for a lot of situations because because they need quick updates. So then you maybe get a proxy in between, right? And that is much faster. But now the proxy is handling all of your traffic, right? Well, whatever traffic is going somewhere is passing through that proxy, which is a problem. Um, in this system, because you um, don't ever update DNS entries, you just uh, update, uh, you just create them, uh, much of this problem is gone, I believe. <laughs> Next question, yeah. Yeah, so I have a question. Uh, so uh, as far as I understand, uh, hash is based on the entire code, not on the, the hash of public API for the service, right? So it's the entire code, but the code will contain the hash of any systems that you talk to. Does that make sense? Um, because if, if, if one system is talking to another system, it needs to use the URL, which is a hash, of that system. Yeah, because my current understanding, if is uh, uh, if the code changes, then the hash of the server changes. Despite, yeah. Right. Um, the the API the public API could probably not not be changed, and you have to redeploy everything both upstream or downstream and downstream from you, the server. You, you uh, sorry, maybe I, I realize I didn't make this very clear. Uh, you if 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 the hash of this changes, right? If the, this there's a new version of the service. Um, the hash of this service is also going to change, but the hash of that one isn't, because somewhere in the source code of this service, you have like a you have a dollar sign substitution with the URL of this service, but that value, what gets interpolated, is now a different one because the hash of this service is different. So now the hash of this service is also different. So that means it also gets redeployed to new world, and then and then the same over here. But that's not true here, right? Because those two systems don't have uh, in their source code, a hash to any of these other systems. Uh, okay, and uh, the hash 
of the dependency in the source code will never get out of sync uh, with the hash of actually deployed. Exactly, because it gets, it gets the, there's a, it's part of a build system, as it were, to you know, convert, convert basically uh, this syntax, right? Where you, you're not actually making the hash, but you're using a sort of substitution variable. Um, and so whenever this value over here changes, then this people app component as well will change. So it never gets out of sync because you ref in the source code you reference uh, a nice name, and then the system keeps track of whether a new hash, whether the, whether what that refers to has changed. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's really nice how you got an uh, idea for infrastructure out of looking at Nix and about looking at what Nix does really well. But I feel that you also get the problem that Nix is, well, maybe not doing bad, but right, they don't have an answer. And the, the one that bothers me here is, is state. So, so Nix is great for configuring all the mutable parts of my system, but it doesn't really help me at all yeah. of dealing with the statefulness of, of the system. I mean, you, you said you want, don't want to go there, but maybe you can say a few words about how you how persistence and stateful things play a role here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, <laughs> so I have some thoughts, but none of them are super convincing here. Um, like, one of the things that's interesting about state is like a, it, it, it's a, a little bit like, you know, like a, a OOP ID, 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 right? It's like, oh, like, th that identity that changes over time, that's how I want to reference it. Like, if I have a database, I don't want to reference the state state of the database at that moment in time, and then redeploy to that state. I want to reference that database and whatever data is in, in there. Um, so you know, intuitively, there's two different types of ID here. But um, what's even more interesting is that these two these two systems sort of interact, right? So with like um, check uh, with checkpointing and cloning and in file systems and DFS and whatnot, right? You can duplicate a state, so you can also reference the state at that moment in time, but probably not by hash, but maybe by hash as well. Um, so, so then you, you, and presumably that could be useful, right? Because in um, this kind of CI and this now going in the direction of hosting as well. But when you when you do testing, very often one thing that could be useful is like, uh, for instance, migration, right? Uh, you, you very often when you write migrations, you write a migration and it works uh, locally because you have no data in your database. Um, and you try deploying it and it doesn't work anymore because of, there's data there. Um, so what would be nice is if you can say, okay, like as part of this test, duplicate whatever data is in the, uh, in the live production website or whatever, try to run this migration. Um, uh, so, so then you, you kind of want to be able to reference uh, reference databases or persistent uh, things in both these ways, right? And I've been thinking a lot about how you could do that. Um, like, there's some intuition about maybe like being able to reference the previous deploy or something like that. So it kind of looks like a like a state monad of some sort or whatever. But um, I don't. I have like if you have ideas, please please share. <laughs> Another short one. The last one. And uh, as far as I understand, with uh, such an approach, uh, if there is uh, no like consistent uh, effort of updating dependencies, assuming you have like multiple pieces, like lots of microservices, you will end up uh, with the same situation as uh, in the need. So you have lots of copies of um, like intermediate uh, small services. Right? Y yeah, although you, like next you can garbage collect them, right? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, uh, they are being garbage collected if they are not referenced. But uh, yeah. they, they will be referenced if, uh, for example, imagine you have a team, the team manages uh, the service, but there are no, uh, not, not many you know, real business logic updates. And, uh, but they need to uh, uh, constantly update hashes of uh, their dependencies. It, it, you know, to, to, to force uh, garbage collection of the old older versions. Um, no, no. So, so, so um, the deployment is a little bit different, right? Because if uh, 
usually in this sort of like microservice deploy infrastructures, you have one team um, and that's responsible for one, one service or a couple of services, and then you have another team and they deploy things completely separately. Um, here, um, and, 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 and team A and team B responsible for services A and B, if, it, if team A deploys, they only deploy uh, service A. Whereas here, uh, I deploy a service A, but that triggers potentially a redeploy of service B as well, even though the team didn't do anything about it. Right? Because that bit, usually the configuration or whatever, the system notices that, um, that the hash of, of B has to also change. So, so you can't continue referencing um, the old version if there's a new version that's being deployed. Um, unless, you, unless, unless you choose to in a more deliberate way, unless you say, okay, like, well, um, you know, make this available in an URL or something. Um, 